Good evening. My name is Ruben Jerome, and I am the Culture and Inclusion Representative of the Black Student Union. And it is my pleasure to be here today at the 2024 Black History Month Lecture. This event is meant to be a continued conversation at Hope College. Tonight, we will hear a keynote lecture from Dr. Sonia Trent Brown, who is Vice President for Culture and Inclusive Excellence here at Hope College. Immediately after the lecture, we will have a Q&A discussion where you will be able to ask questions via Google form. To submit any questions, please scan the QR code on the screen, or we have no cards for you to write your questions and we will submit them online for you. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land we stand on. Together, we acknowledge that we gather as Hope College on the traditional land of the Peoria, Badawatomi, Ottawa, and Ojibwa peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. As a community, we recognize the ever-present systemic inequities that stem directly from past wrongdoings. We acknowledge this long history of injustice and commit to educating ourselves and our community as we seek to honor the legacy and culture of the indigenous peoples. <clears throat> We are grateful to the GROW Advocacy Council, the Black Student Union, the Culture and Inclusive Excellence Division, and the Center for Diversity and Inclusion for their support in sponsoring this program. Again, thank you for coming to this lecture, and I hope you enjoy it. But more importantly, I hope you learn something new that will inspire you. Next, the Black Student Union will be showing a short video that will briefly highlight historical and present Black and African American figures in honor of Black History Month. Hello, my name is Michaela Turner and I'm the president of BSU. And my key figure is Amanda Gorman. Did you know that in 2017, she was named the nation's first ever national youth poet Lorette? And she inspires me because she uses her poems to talk about the racism and other important issues and social issues. And she believes that poetry can be a tool for change and promote change. Hi everyone, I'm Simone and I'm the treasurer of BSU. Did you know that Missy Copeland didn't actually start dancing until she was 13 years old? As a dancer myself, Missy Copeland inspires me to be myself in every and all circumstances. Hello everyone, my name is Ruben and I'm the Culture and Inclusion Committee representative for Black Student Union. Did you know that Alexander Miles created a patent for elevators so that the doors can close automatically and open? This inspires me to understand that small changes are important too and I can create small changes that will impact my community. Hi guys, my name is Aurora Shima and my position on BSU is Mentoring Culture Service Coordinator. And did you know that Kimberly Crenshaw was the one that coined the term intersectionality, which looks at how race, gender, ethnicity, and other characteristics affect and overlap in systematic discrimination. And this is important, especially when looking at inequality in health uh, For me, it inspires me to not just look at a person as they present themselves, but there are other factors that are dealing with them. Hey guys, my name is Lanaya, and I am BSU's trustee. Did you know that Andy Wiley is a black artist that changed the story of how black people are portrayed in history? He took the European plastic paintings and replaced them with black people in a beautiful light. He inspires me as a black artist to go beyond the boundaries in art and explore my creativity. Hi, my name's Savannah. I'm the social outreach chair for Black Student Union. Did you know Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman to ever be elected into Congress? She inspires me because she was fighting for her dreams and even in a time like the civil rights movement, she let no one or nothing stop her. Hi everyone, my name is Sierra. I'm the secretary for BSU. And did you know that Shonda Rhimes is one of the only people in cinema history to create TV shows that star women from minority backgrounds and place them in positions of power and affluence? It is because of Shonda's willingness to continue to diversify Hollywood that I'm not afraid to use my creativity to break boundaries. Hi, my name is Jayla and I'm PR for BSU. Someone who inspires me is Madam C.J. Walker as she is a trailblazer for many different reasons. First and foremost, she was a pioneering entrepreneur who became the first female self-made millionaire in the United States through her successful hair care and beauty line. Um, she played a significant role in empowering African American women economically by providing job opportunities and financial independence. She inspires me because she is someone who spoke up for black women and gave them a voice throughout the years. 
My name is Konfion Tsubuyu. I am the Vice President for the Black Student Union. Ruby Bridges was the first black student to integrate into a white elementary school at only six years old. And something that we can learn from her is to have resilience and courage in difficult situations. So, I hope you learned something new and happy Black History Month. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Javon Willis, and I serve as a director for the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. It is indeed my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Um, this is Black History Month, and one of the things I just wanted to make sure to do, um, just before I get into the welcome, is to recognize the Black Student Union. Um, the Black Student Union, first known as the Black Coalition, was founded in 1968. And so when I think about the 56 years currently of student advocacy, the 56 years of amplifying and raising the experiences, the voices and experiences of this black community, um, I am so grateful for the good work that the Black Student Union has done and will continue to do moving forward in the future. Can you give it up for BSU? Now, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today for the Black History Month lecture, my vice president, Dr. Sonia Trent Brown. Dr. Sonia Trent Brown serves as the Vice President for Culture and Inclusive Excellence at Hope College and was named the John H. and Jean M. Jacobson Professor of Psychology from 2015 to 2019. Dr. Trent Brown completed her BA in Psychology at Harvard University, earned an MA in Experimental Psychology from the University of South Florida, and a PhD in Cognitive and Neurosciences, also from USF in Tampa. Dr. Trent Brown came to Hope in 2005, and thank God she did, as a professor in the psychology department. She has taught courses including lifespan developmental psychology, cognitive psychology, advanced research, psychology and culture, phonetics in the brain, and psycholinguistic seminars. She has mentored over 180 undergraduate students in research in the areas of psycholinguistics, psychoacoustics, child development, nature-based learning, and racial healing, and was a top three finalist for the Midwestern Psychological Association Excellence in Mentoring Award in 2023. During her time at Hope, Dr. Trent Brown has served as chair of the Residential Life Committee, chair of Campus Life Board, faculty representative to the Board of Trustees, and as an advisor for the Black Student Union and Theta Gamma Pi, a multicultural sorority. She is a Franklin and Marshall College Emerging Scholars Fellow, WYE Faculty Fellow, and National Inclusive Excellence Leadership Academy Fellow. She has received the Janet L. Anderson Excellence in Teaching Award in 2012, and the Hope Outstanding Professor Educator Award and also in 2012. Dr. Trent Brown was recognized in top 25 psychology professors in Michigan in 2012, as well as in the journals of Black in Higher Education Honors and Awards in 2013. She received the inaugural Hope College Social Scientist Young <clears throat> Investigators Award and the Midwestern Psychological Association Psychi Regional Research Award for faculty student collaborative research and served as counselor and secretary with the Council on Undergraduate Research Social Science Division. Dr. Trent Brown earned an honorable mention for the 2015 Council for Advancement and Support of Education U.S. Professor of the Year Award and her research has been funded by the Kaplan Foundation for Early Childhood, the Kellogg Foundation, and the Sci Chi International Honor Society in psychology, and also the Society for Research and Child Development grant. 
Lastly, Dr. Trent Brown is a proud McKnight Doctoral Fellowship alumnus. And a couple, I think, yeah, just this past weekend was with students down in Florida and that, with that. Um, so it goes without saying, um, Dr. Trent Brown has the receipts. <laughs> she is valid, accomplished, um, and one of the things that I love, I love, is working with somebody that you know that cares just as much, if not even as deeply, as you do. And so, I am so thankful for you, Dr. Trent Brown, and so grateful for the gift that you are to our Hope College community. So can you please help me by welcoming, by round of applause, Dr. Sonia Trent Brown to the stage. Wow, that is so nice. Thank you all. I um, I actually am feeling uh, a deep sense of gratitude right now for being in the space. Um, deep sense of gratitude for each of you that is here this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Ruben, for your gracious welcome. Thank you to BSU for that wonderful video. Thank you, Javon, for your kind words of introduction. Um, it's, it's great to be here and to spend this time with you this afternoon. Um, as we get started, I am going to say that I am Dr. Sonia Trent Brown. I am a five foot, 10 inches tall African-American woman with brown hair and wearing glasses and a mask. I am wearing a black dress with white abstract polka dots and black pumps. I'm standing at a podium located in the center of a large room. Nina sang. Alvin danced, Gordon photographed, Lorraine wrote, Maya spoke. So I can sing, dance, photograph, write, and speak. I am also thankful to be here with you today uh, as I've been under the weather a little bit lately. So this is the most voice that I've had in a while. I'm grateful for that. We'll see how it goes throughout our time together this afternoon. Thank you, CDI, for 40 years of presence at Hope College, making connections, forming relationships, creating community one day at a time for 40 years since Alfredo Gonzalez first took leadership in 1984. Friends, would you please join me in congratulating CDI on the 40th anniversary? <laughs> All right, so I am going to go ahead and see how I'm doing, that's great, great, great. Okay, so by way of a brief review for Black History Month, uh, Carter G. Woodson is known as the father of black history. The historian was the second black student to graduate from Harvard University with a doctorate degree. His trailblazing research led to the establishment of Black History Week in 1926. And at the time, Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History announced the second week of February to be Negro History Week. This week was chosen because it coincided with the birthday of Abraham Lincoln on February 12th and that of Frederick Douglass on February 14th, both of which black communities had celebrated since the late 19th century. 50 years after the first celebration in 1976, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History influenced the shift from a week to a month and also instituted a language shift from Negro to Black. Now, many here are familiar with Frederick Douglass, an American social reformer, abolitionist, orator, writer, and statesman. 
Some say that Douglas became the most important leader of the movement for African American civil rights in the 19th century. Truth be told, my first crush was on Frederick Douglass. <clears throat> I get that that is uh, unusual. But true, but true. I first read his autobiography narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass when I was in the sixth grade, and I thought he was just the most. <laughs> uh, so that's a, that, is a, that is a true story. Uh, all right, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History also establishes the annual Black History Month theme, which this year is African Americans and the Arts. Now, there are thousands of black artists who have made significant contributions to the arts over the centuries. Again, Nina sang, Alvin danced, Gordon photographed, Lorraine wrote, Maya spoke. So that we can sing, dance, photograph, write, and speak. Now, this month, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is part of the Smithsonian Museums Network in DC, is offering a digital toolkit that could be worth checking out. Uh, the museum website states that African American artists, poets, writers, visual artists, and dancers have historically served as change agents through their crafts, drawn from their ancestors' ancient rites of passage and the shared hopes of liberty, black artists continue to fuse the rhythmic cadence of creative expressions with the pulsating beats of progress. The museum celebrates Black History Month 2024 by highlighting the art of resistance and the artists who use their crafts to uplift the race, speak truth to power, and inspire a nation. And so I thought today, to honor the theme, that we would first spend some time highlighting a few such artists. From our rich history of artists who forge new pathways in the arts to the contemporary artistic genius innovating now and for the future. And once we've had a chance to do that, then we'll look at the higher education context for those who are young, gifted, and black today through a lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging, as well as the current context of anti-DEI legislation and the potential impact that it might have on the future of higher education. So I said that Nina sang, <clears throat> so as we open up, let's hear a bit from her melodious tones now. voice was the voice of an era, called the high priestess of soul, the art of this American singer, songwriter, pianist, composer, arranger, and civil rights activist spanned styles, including classical, folk, gospel, blues, jazz, R&B, and pop. Nina herself referred to her music as black classical music. Nina felt that an artist's duty is to reflect the times. According to her official website, she was one of the most extraordinary artists of the 20th century, an icon of American music. She was the consummate musical storyteller. As a griot, 
she would come to learn who used her remarkable talent to create a legacy of liberation, empowerment, passion, and love through a magnificent body of works. She earned that name, High Priestess of Soul, because she could weave a spell that was said to be so seductive and hypnotic that the listener lost track of time and space as they became absorbed in the moments that she created. She was who the world would come to know as the voice of an era. This classic song that we've just heard a clip of, To Be Young, Gifted, and Black, is considered to be Nina's own anthem of empowerment. It was also an anthem of empowerment for many young black artists. The song was written in memory of Nina's good friend, Lorraine Hansberry. And the title of the song came from a play that Hansberry had been working on just prior to her death. So Nina has opened us. <clears throat> Let us go ahead and have an opportunity to look at some of the artistic genres. <laughs> yep, that is not what I would like to do. There we go. All right, so we're gonna start with literature and poetry. And as we go through, we're gonna look at a historic figure and then follow with a more contemporary artist. And so uh, first up here is Paul Lawrence Dunbar, poet, author, literary genius. Um, he's credited as the first writer to put the African-American experience in all of its diverse forms before a broader audience. His work became the voice for the African-American experience in America at that time. Uh, Dunbar became known for his use of dialect to capture the African-American experience. Now, segments from Dunbar's biography uh, inform us that he wrote more than just poetry. He wrote literature in all of its venues, poems, novels, newspaper articles, lyrics for Broadway musicals. He wrote short stories, operettas, ballads, orations. He's credited as the first writer to put the African-American experience uh, <clears throat> before that large audience. And um, his talent could not be confined to that form alone. He was an experimenter, an innovator. He tried to express his feelings and vision in the many forms that literature offers. He has been called the poet laureate of his people and has become a voice for all people. Throughout all of his writing, runs the desire to explain the ambitions, the hopes, the dreams of African Americans. He strived to show to the world the reality of blacks as caring, thoughtful, creative individuals, as people, not as stereotypes. He was an African American struggling with the racism and oppression of his time, and yet a spokesperson for all who have dreams unfulfilled. So why did, I, why did I choose to talk about Paul Lawrence Dunbar today? Well, when we were little girls, my father used to read from, to us from Dunbar and from Langston Hughes for bedtime stories at night. I looked forward to hearing my father's deep, strong baritone, although he'll tell you he sang tenor, <laughs> 10 or 12 miles away. That's what, he, that's what he would always say. Uh, but he actually has a lovely voice, and hearing him read to us was one of my favorite experiences of my lifetime. So um, let's listen to just a bit of one of our Dunbar favorites, which is The Party, as told by Oni Lasana, a story artist, author, spoken word poet, and musician. They had a great big party down at Tom the other night. Was I there? You bet, honey. I never in my life seen such a sight. All the folks from four settlements was invited and they come. They come trooping thick as churn when them churn hear the five and drunk. Everybody dressed they finest. I show mouth and get away. I ain't seen such fancy dressing since last quarter meeting day. Gals all dressed up in silk and satins, not a wrinkle nor a crease. Eyes are batting, teeth are shining. Hair brushed back as slick as grease. Skirt all right. 
again. Okay. Yes. All right. So now for a contemporary artist in the literature and poetry um, <clears throat> classification, I selected Yori Berry, who I first encountered while participating in the NCAA Inclusion Forum um, as the HOPE's Athletics, Diversity, and Inclusion designee. Now, Yori Berry is a poet, orator, writer, a children's rights advocate, and the National Network for Youth Director of Youth Partnerships. She has worked tirelessly to build the National Youth Advisory Council, and she was the youngest graduate of the Harvard University Summer Leadership Institute. Now, Yori gave one of the keynote addresses at the Inclusion Forum that year, uh, and it was delivered the entire thing through the medium of spoken word. So here is a sample of her powerful artistry with words. Do you know what it means to be your ancestors' wildest dreams? Mm. To be the inspiration why generations before you persevered against all odds and generations after you believe in the pursuit of happiness, life, and liberty to carry a legacy, to make history, to chart your own destiny, to wholly embrace your heritage and all that makes you unique, to unapologetically speak truth to power, unafraid to tell your story, to be brilliant, resilient, courageous, and free to unequivocally believe that you, that we can win more than championships and games because together, Together, we have the power to change the world and transform communities, to stand for something bigger than ourselves, freedom, justice, equality, to embody the essence of unity, to ensure every person on this earth has access to education and opportunity, to be bold, to be brave, to authentically embrace and celebrate the differences and diversity that makes us great to work together, to build together, to win together as a team, to leave this world better than it was when we came. You game? All right. Are we game? Now, when life unexpectedly came crashing, Yuri suddenly found herself living on the African continent being alone in a new city, new country, new continent, yet feeling more at home than she felt at home, illuminated a sense of invisibility and erasure experienced as a black woman living in the United States. Upon returning home, she ultimately realized that we cannot help nor can we heal what we do not love and cannot see. Yuri's work commemorates and celebrates the beauty of blackness across generations and how a journey to love the skin we're in and an unrelenting embrace of our whole selves paves the way for freedom. All right, so there's two from literature and poetry. From the visual arts, what we're seeing here is our historic Contributor Henry Osawa Tanner was the first African-American painter to gain international acclaim. Tanner moved to Paris, France in 1891 to study at the Académie Julian and gained acclaim in French artistic circles. The painting that is depicted is entitled The Banjo Lesson, and it's one of the works for which Tanner is most well known. This oil painting depicts a grandfather passing on his creative knowledge to his grandson a tender moment of human interaction. Now, the painting was Tanner's first that was accepted into the Paris Salon, and it has uh, been held by Hampton University since 1894. According to artist Stella Grace Lyons, despite his success and clear skill, Tanner frequently experienced racism during his time in America. He recalled, and these are his words, I was extremely timid and to be made to feel that I was not wanted, although in a place where I had every right to be. Even months afterwards caused me sometimes weeks of pain. 
Tanner painted black people with grace, dignity, and sensitivity. Beauty was an image of extreme resilience. And through his groundbreaking work, Tanner debunked racist notions that had persisted for years. Now, as we look at our contemporary artist, this is an up-and-coming multimedia, multi-genre artist in Chicago named Taharka Baraka, and he was trained as a software engineer, but considers himself an engineer turned painter, digital artist, and creative technologist. The image that we see here is of a larger than life-sized art installation at Iridium Lab 77 in Chicago. It is a 30-foot mural entitled The Passionate Crowd. Taharka says that he loves working at the intersection between tech and artistry. From interactive art installations to AR, VR experiences, as well as more standard forms of animation, graphics, and media. He enjoys creating experiences and telling stories. Now, I will say that I truly appreciate Taharka Baraka's innovative uses of media. I have also had the opportunity to watch sessions of Baraka doing a live candid art, capturing the events and people in the surrounding active environment. And it's been remarkable to see how rapidly his artistic career has blossomed. Uh, full transparency, he also is my nephew. <laughs> But it has just been amazing to see the many invitations that he's been getting to create and the work that he's been able to display. Uh, so really, really excited for his future. All right, so music. Now, this was hard for me because this is a place where I feel very personally connected. So I had to move myself out of the way, and I selected artists and pieces that represent musical genres that got their starts in the United States. Now, hip-hop culture is much more than music alone. It is a grassroots movement that encompasses poets, visual artists, urban philosophers, who each have contributed their voices and their visions um, and utilizing whatever means were available to them. However, music is a central element that has been preserved over time in this artistic movement that was created by African Americans, pioneered from black American street culture, also known as hip hop African American culture. It had been around for years prior to uh, when it became more mainstream, emerging from New York in the early 1970s. Now, the piece that I've selected represents early rap styles. Uh, and while hip hop is not only comprised of rap, Rapper's Delight was ranked at number 251 on Rolling Stone Magazine's list of the greatest 500 songs of all time in 2010. It was number two on VH1's 100 Greatest Hip Hop Songs. Um, it's also included on NPR's list of the 100 most important American musical works of the 20th century. It was preserved in the National Recording Registry by the Library of Congress in 2011 for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Now, the artists are Michael Wonder Mike Wright, Henry Big Bang Hank Jackson, and Guy Master G. O'Brien. They are known as the Sugar Hill Gang, and they are best known for this hit single, Rapper's Delight. So as we listen to a bit of this, feel free to sing along with parts that you know, I know that I will be. <laughs> All right. Here's Wonder Mike, Hank, and Master G, the Sugar Hill Gang. The hip, the hip, the hip, the hip, 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 you don't stop. Rock it out, baby, bubble to the boogie dee bang bang, the boogie to the boogie dee bee. Now what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. And me, the groove, and my friends are gonna try to move your feet. You see, I am Wonder Mike, and I like to say hello. Oh, to the black, to the white, the red, and the brown, and the purple, and yellow. But first, I gotta bang, bang, the boogie to the boogie. Say up, jump, the boogie to the bang, bang, boogie. Let's rock. You don't stop. Rock the rhythm, that'll make your body rock. Well, so All right. All right. So maybe that brings back some memories for some of us. <laughs> All right, so hip hop 
right, as a uniquely American form, and jazz, right, jazz. Now this piece, believe it or not, takes me back to my graduate school days. Uh, I'd be sitting in the lab, it'd be two, three o'clock in the morning, I'm working on data analysis, and when I'd start to get sleepy, I put on an Ella Fitzgerald CD to pep things up a bit. That and I came to magnify the Lord. I don't know if you know that one. And it's another day's journey and I'm glad. And I was glad too, glad that God was bringing me through graduate school. I tell you, I could not do it uh, without the Creator. Now, uh, you probably get this gospel song, but maybe wondering why I was listening to Ella. And again, my dad just loves jazz, and he was a music aficionado. I grew up listening to my dad's albums more so than listening to popular music of the times. So my favorites were among his extensive collection. Now, thanks, thanks to this collection, I wanted to be Natalie Cole when I grew up. I was also super excited to win VIP passes to a Lou Rawls concert on the radio while I was in grad school. And we got to go backstage and everything. Look, and then I met Lou Rawls. And he, and he said, oh, let me ask you something. He said, how did you get to know my music? Most of my fans are a little older than you. <laughs> And I told him, you know, that I grew up listening to his music because that was my dad's music, right? And so my father really deeply appreciates jazz. And this is a musical genre emerging from the African-American communities of New Orleans, Louisiana, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, with its roots in blues and ragtime. Now, since the 1920s, jazz age... Jazz has been recognized as a major form of musical expression in traditional and popular music. So this is how I got to know and appreciate Ella Fitzgerald, who was known as the First Lady of Song, the Queen of Jazz, and Lady Ella. Let's listen to a little bit of Ella. The First Lady of Song, is that her nickname? Maybe so. Maybe so. Summertime And the living is easy Fish are jumping is high. All right, all right. Now, despite living during a time when music in America was divided into two categories, popular music and race music, this iconic singer, Ella Fitzgerald, was the first black person to ever win a Grammy. And she ultimately went on to win a total of 14 Grammys, as well as the Lifetime Achievement Award in 1967. Now, I'm only supposed to have two. But these were both historic, and I thought that maybe we still needed to hear from, oh gosh, yes. <laughs> a contemporary artist, and I probably don't need to say a whole lot about Queen Bee. Um, but I did decide to introduce her, include her as a contemporary artist because she just made history again in 2023. She is now officially the greatest Grammy winner in the 65-year history of the award. With her recent award, yes, yes, for Best Dance Electronic Album for her extremely popular 2022 album, Renaissance, she now has 30 two Grammys. Yeah. And Hungarian-British conductor George Sulti has 31. So, you know, she also became the first black woman to win in the best dance electronic album category. So we'll see. She may, she may yet win more. <laughs> I think it is probably likely that she may win more. Let's <laughs>
gonna go, we're gonna go on, but that was a remarkable performance. Um, let's see, I oh, okay, there we go, okay. Now, recall earlier that I mentioned that Nina Simone's song, Young, Gifted, and Black, was taken from a play Lorraine Hansberry was working on before she died in 1965. Now, in 1959, Lorraine Hansberry made history as the first African-American woman to have a show produced on Broadway, and it was a raisin in the sun. Now, as a playwright, feminist, and racial justice activist, Hansberry never shied away from tough topics during her rather short and also rather extraordinary life. Um, let's get a chance to hear from Lorraine Hansberry in her own words. The most ordinary human being, to almost repeat what I just said, mm -hmm. has within him elements of profundity, uh, of profound uh, anguish, that there is, you don't have to go to the kings and queens of the earth. I think the Greeks and the Elizabethans did this because it was a a logical concept, but every human being is an enormous conflict about something, even if it's how you get to work in the morning mm -hmm. and all of that. So that I thought that it would be very interesting in the contemporary American uh, theatrical moment mm -hmm. to explore the most ordinary man, say, on the south side of Chicago, mm -hmm. who we mm -hmm. think we know. Mm -hmm. You know, he drives you to work and you say, well, he's a nice fellow. Mm -hmm. But see what he's like at home in some of the ordinary events by the time he gets to work. He's a complicated and large person. Yes, and she also is a complicated and large person. But she really did recognize um, the role of her work in responding to the things that were going on at the times. You can see some of her notable quotes there, that one cannot live with sighted eyes and feeling heart and not know or react to the miseries which afflict this world. Right? I have come to maturity, as we all must, knowing that greed and malice and indifference to human misery, bigotry and corruption, brutality and perhaps above all else, ignorance abound in this world. And then, you are young, gifted, and black. In the year 1964, I, for one, can think of no more dynamic combination that a person might be. Those are words to carry us forward. The most ordinary. And there we go. Okay, now, a contemporary playwright and this is another treat. This is Lynn Nottage, an American playwright and screenwriter whose work often focuses on the experience of working class people, particularly working class people who are black. She has received the Pulitzer Prize for drama twice. Once in 2009 for her play Ruined, and then again in 2017 for her play Sweat. She was the first and remains the only woman to have won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama two times. Now, Nottage is the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Fellowship and was included in Time Magazine's 2019 list of the 100 most influential people. She's currently an associate professor of playwriting at Columbia University and an artist in residence at the Park Avenue Armory. She is a powerhouse artist, as evidenced by this news clip about her work. A playwright is making history tonight with three shows taking the stage all in one night here in the city. Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and screenwriter Lynn Nottage has a play, a musical and an opera all running tonight. CBS 2's Corey James spoke with her about this accomplishment. This is an incredible moment. Playwright Lynn Nottage is breaking barriers. The Pulitzer Prize winner has not one, not two, but three shows performing in New York City in one night, something Nottage says no other black woman in the industry has done. All right. So someone to really keep our eyes on going forward. Uh, now, choreography and dance, Alvin Ailey is our historic artist for this section. He was a dancer, choreographer, director, and activist who said that one of America's richest treasures was the cultural heritage of the African American. Sometimes sorrowful, sometimes jubilant, but always 
hopeful. Now, this selection is of a suite of dances that are part of Revelations. Revelations has been called an enduring classic that is a tribute to that African-American cultural heritage and to Ailey's genius. Using African-American traditional spirituals, this suite fervently explores the places of deepest grief and holiest joy in the soul. All right, so let us get a chance to watch this compilation. the joy and, this, and, the, and the, 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 the movement right, expressed with the songs. All right, uh, traditional African-American spirituals are among my favorite songs, uh, and I've not seen Revelations in person, but I hope to be able to someday. Now, and um, this was Misty Copeland, world-renowned ballerina, was already introduced to us. Um, Misty is going to be starring in and producing Flower, which is a short film that tells a powerful story through dance and movement uh, with a mission to highlight intergenerational equity and to bring critical attention to the housing crisis in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so this project marks the first independently produced endeavor from uh, Life, in Motion uh, Life in Motion Productions. And this is a company that's founded by Copeland and her uh, co-writer, producer, Leila Fayaz. Now, Misty Copeland, um, as we heard, made history as the first African-American female principal dancer with the prestigious American Ballet Theater. She was described as a true prodigy, as we heard. Um, it, it started at 13 years old, and then within three months, she's on point. Three months on point, right? <clears throat> now, when she discovered ballet, she was living in a motel room with her five siblings, uh, you know, trying to find a place to sleep on the floor. And so that, that provides some insight into her passion regarding the housing crisis. Now here is, uh, and we saw some, some beautiful images that were shared for us in the video.
go ahead and move on just because I want to make sure that when I'm thinking about our time, um, you know, this uh, flower I think is going to be really great. She says that it represents the evolution of all her work as a performer, storyteller, and activist, uh, and as someone whose family experienced the instability of not always having a safe place to call home as a child. Those issues of homelessness and not having access to basic life needs have always been important to her. All right, so we've had a chance to learn about artists in various genres. Yep. <coughs> Both our historic heritage and contemporary contributions. Now, each artist shared the stories of their experiences with the world. Stories of life and love, grief and joy, loss and hope. Art is able to capture the kaleidoscopic complexity of the human experience and represents an integral part of our cultural heritage as well as an expression of cultural realities for future generations. Now we are in a higher education context. What is the opportunity for continued expression of African American art forms and artists in higher ed? or here at Hope College. Now, it depends to a degree on the kinds of environments we establish for our students, as well as staff and faculty, to feel supported in the full expression of the art forms of the cultural heritage. Now, thinking intentionally about the higher ed environment is of tremendous importance to support artistic expression. Unfortunately, I have heard <clears throat> from students not necessarily here, uh, but who haven't felt that they could be themselves or fully express their culture and, tra and traditions. Now, thinking intentionally about diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging can help to create the kinds of environments that would help to promote cultural expression. Now, here are some working definitions. There are so many different definitions. <clears throat> some of these might align with your uh, thinking, they may differ. Um, so diversity, difference, right? The rich diversity that's created by God. Equity, thinking about fairness and justice and focusing on the outcomes that are most appropriate for a given group. Recognizing different challenges, needs, and different histories. Inclusion involves authentic and empowered participation with a true sense of belonging and full access to opportunities. Inclusion is an active process and it's an ongoing process. We are always continually in the process of including. Accessibility, being able to get to where you need to go, being able to fully participate when you arrive, being able to have access to all information. And belonging, feeling connected and valued and having the belief that you are an important part of the group. And so these are some working definitions. There are myriad benefits that have been highlighted in the research literature as well. Here are five benefits of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging in higher ed. Right? One, that campus cultural diversity enriches the educational experience because we get the benefit of learning from one another and our different approaches. That different approaches takes us to the next one. The diversity on campus improves communication and thought processing skills because we do think differently and we do bring those different lenses. But we have to communicate what's going on here with us to someone else so that they can receive it through their lens. Right? And that helps us all to develop better thought processing skills. Right? <clears throat> Some of the research actually uses the language that it makes us smarter because we work harder in some of these instances, making sure that we are building our skills. Campus diversity challenges stereotypes. Right? It gives us opportunities to see lots of different folks from different walks of life. Uh, students can see themselves and their leaders, and then diversity better prepares students for the workforce. Now about that workforce piece, <clears throat> when we look at um, the reports from the National Association of Colleges and Employers, they very clearly identify what the career readiness competencies are that they are looking for college graduates to have uh, access to. And you can see them there. We do see that equity and inclusion 
is there, as well as teamwork, communication, leadership, critical thinking. When we look at this figure, this is actually one of my, one of my favorites. In the blue bars, what we're looking at is the skills, right, the extent to which employers feel that a certain kind of skill or capacity, a career readiness capacity, is important. The purple bars are where the employers think the college graduates are. So you see those gaps, right? In critical thinking, 55, just, well, just under 56%, 98.5%. Communication, teamwork, right? Equity and inclusion, there's a gap. It's actually a little closer there. Uh, professionalism, technology is the closest one, right? Maybe that makes sense to us. Career and self-development, leadership. So there are gaps, right? We want to create the kinds of environments that are going to give our students the opportunity to close those gaps, so that they're going to be at where the blue bars are and not where the purple bars are. Um, and so, you know, when we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, accessibility, and belonging in higher ed, most of it came out of um, a civil rights movement in the 60s. At that time, one in five student protests were demanding an end to racial discrimination on campus. Right, at the height of student activism in the 1960s. <clears throat> um, through those demands that were made by the students, institutions did start to think differently about potential for offering a new curriculum. Right, so African American studies and black studies programs emerged. About 500 African American studies programs, departments, institutes had been founded at four-year colleges by 1971. However, some of those um, didn't really get lived into. There were some concerns uh, about whether or not there was too much for black nationalism. Right? Uh, some of them were not well resourced. And so over time, some of those atrophied right? and uh, down to about 450. Affirmative action, right? stepping uh, more uh, forward into the future, if we look over the past three decades, there are 10 states that had banned affirmative action with the result of having 23% uh, percent less students of color who are qualified likely to get admitted to public colleges without the affirmative action policies. We know that we've just recently had a SCOTUS decision that's going to impact us going forward as well. When we look at leadership and um, uh, graduate degrees, less than one third of college presidents were women in 2016. Uh, the share of black recipients of doctorates increased less than 1% between 2010 and 2019. If you look at gender uh, for the doctorates that, are, that were awarded, uh, the SNE is science and engineering, uh, and then non-science and engineering. Most of the growth in the number of doctorates earned by both men and women has been in science and engineering fields. Uh, during this period, the number of female doctorate recipients in SNE fields increased by 94%. This is over the past 20 years, up through 2022, compared with a 62% increase in the number of male SNE doctorate recipients. The proportion of female doctorate recipients in science and engineering increased from 39% in 2002 to 42% in 2009. It stayed fairly stable through 2019, increased to 44% by 2022. In the non-science and engineering fields, women earned 59% of doctorates in 2022, and that stayed around that 57 to 59 mark since the early 2000s. <clears throat> when we look at race and ethnicity, um, we actually see that the number of um, Hispanic or Latino doctorate re recipients in science and engineering um, increased from about 5% to 9% over that 20 year period. The number of black or African American doctorate recipients in science and engineering increased from 4% uh, to 6%. So we're still talking about relatively low numbers there. And 
we have to continue thinking about what's going to come with the anti-DEI legislation that we've seen introduced in higher ed. Uh, they're tracking legislation that would prohibit colleges from having diversity, equity, and inclusion offices or staff, ban mandatory diversity training, prohibit institutions from using diversity statements in hiring and promotion, or prohibit colleges from using race, sex, color, ethnicity, or natural, national origin in admissions or employment. Now, the Chronicle of Higher Education has a tracker. In 2023, in June, when we looked at the numbers, this is what those numbers looked like for the legislation that had been introduced. Most recent numbers as of February 9, so just a few days ago, this is what those numbers look like. So you can see, and I'll toggle back, there's been a significant increase in the number of bills that's been introduced. <clears throat> Here is what the distribution looked like in 2023. Gray was no bill, light green was introduced, uh, the, uh, the middle green was final legislative approval, the darker green was signed into law, the brown was tabled, failed to pass, or vetoed. So again, this is 2023. When you look at the 2024, you see that there's a great, degree, a great deal more uh, activity. <clears throat> Here is what they look like in terms of how they would uh, were laid out in 2023 with respect to DEI offices and staff and mandatory DEI training. 2024, right, we see that change. And then diversity statements and identity-based preferences for hiring and admissions, 2023. And we see that change in 2024. All right, there is another tracker um, that is uh, the UCLA School of Law's Critical Race Studies Program, CRT tracker. They've been tracking since September 2020. They've got a total of 244 local, state, and federal government entities that have introduced 783 anti-CRT bills, resolutions, executive orders, opinion letters, statements, or other measures. At this site, um, they've been tracking the number of measures, and you can see how that's changed since 2020, and the increase through 2022, and into 2023. There's an interactive map at the site, <clears throat> You'll note that at Michigan, we do have one adopted city or county government. <clears throat> and so when you, when, you, when you hover over that, you get some additional information. Um, and, so, and again, you can actually get to the full text of the legislation if you would like to do that. And so if you have an interest, um, then you have access there. All right, so those are some of the things that could potentially impact, and we have been hearing some, that there are uh, faculty of color who are thinking about leaving higher ed, right? Thinking about what the environment is, go is going to be like. Um, if when, during the questions, maybe if you're interested in more of that, I can share with you some of the experiences of some of my colleagues uh, in other states. But as we get ready to leave, um, <clears throat> right, as my time draws to a close, you see what I did there? Drawing. Okay, it was supposed to be artistic. Okay. <laughs> um, but there are some celebrations and opportunities that we have, right? We have for the past couple of years uh, been recipients of the uh, Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award. That has been, yeah, it's been really wonderful. I think it's been the evidence of the things that our students, right, the way our students are engaging and their leadership that we see across campus, the way that faculty and staff, alumni, board of trustees members are leaning in, uh, and that's been, that's been brilliant. Right? You see some of the things that were highlighted by the review committee in terms of the things that, that, um, that led them to recognize us with this award. I do want to say that you know, the fact that we were recognized with an award 
uh, while it speaks to our efforts, it does not mean we have arrived. <laughs> Right, right, I just want to make sure, right, it does not mean we have arrived. That journey is ongoing. Right? We continue to journey together, working together to create the kind of environment in which persons from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation will be able to flourish at Hope College. Right? Uh, the Higher Learning Commission, again, thank you, all of you, who, for the work you've done, the energies and efforts you've invested, and for a wonderful, clean visit. Last fall, right, only 37% of baccalaureate institutions, institutions like HOPE, had visit outcomes without the requirement for additional monitoring. That's wonderful to be keeping company with that group of folks. Now, we do have some recommendations, right? That's the opportunity, right? So we have the celebration. Uh, we have an opportunity uh, that this success is worth maintaining by continuing what we're doing well and addressing the small number of concerns from our team report, right? Such as the recommendation for ongoing assessment of culture and climate. Um, and then the arts at Hope College. We are the first private liberal arts college to hold national accreditation in art, dance, music, theater. We've been featured in creative colleges, a guide for student actors, artists, dancers, musicians, and writers. Right? Uh, our arts programming provides our community with a robust selection of vibrant cultural experiences. Right? Classes, performances, visiting artists, workshops, the Kreisinga Art Museum. We have a phenomenal access to the arts and the things that our colleagues in the arts are doing on campus and providing opportunities for our students, for all of us, for the community. Incredible. And then um, the last thing I would say, and you know, this is maybe the most important thing for me, but um, embracing the creative gifts with which we've been blessed. Right, to glorify and honor God. A Creative God, Awaken Your God-Given Imagination. This is a book that's actually authored by our very own Anna Bonema. Um, and, you know, God is the greatest artist. And we are made in his image. Our creator has given humankind the inspiration to create myriad wonderful works of art. And God is the source of our inspiration and, and creativity. So I said... As we started, right, that Nina sang, Alvin danced, Gordon photographed, Lorraine wrote, Maya spoke, so that I can sing, dance, photograph, write, and speak. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> mm. Maybe I should get something to I'm just gonna get this. All right. Have a signal. <laughs> oh. All right, good old technology it's, for you, some mm -hmm. technical difficulties. <laughs> So we're going to go and head into our Q&A session. My name is Sierra. I have the pleasure of serving as BSU secretary. And I want to thank you guys for coming out tonight for your, and thank you for your engagement. And thank you, Dr. Trent Brown, for your very interesting lecture. So we're going to go ahead and get, get into the questions now. But um, if you guys feel free to scan the QR code. And if you guys want, we do have some note cards. Um, over in the back, if you guys want to do the more traditional route to write out your questions. Okay. 
So, the first question, with your work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and accessibility, and belonging at Hope College, where have you seen growth here at Hope, and what are some ways that the campus still needs to work on? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, I've seen growth in a few ways. Um, so, I, you know, the Board of Trustees um, undertook some work a couple of years ago, and they, um, the work uh, led them to change the, the bylaws um, so that the bylaws now include ongoing oversight <clears throat> for culture, diversity, and inclusion. And then that was also, that also became part of the decision-making responsibility areas for the Protecting the Mission Committee. And so that, um, it's great that there is an arm that is specifically identified there. So I think that that's one area. I will also say that the Board of Trustees responded to student voices. Uh, when we were going through uh, the Higher Learning Commission Quality Initiative, <clears throat> um, our cycle, our accreditation cycle is a 10-year cycle. And between years five and nine, the institution is required to undertake a, a quality initiative. So we're looking at something in our in institution that we want to uh, make some improvements in, continue to grow in. And the, um, we did a decentralized approach where units set goals around the areas of culture, diversity, inclusion, equity, accessibility. And, um, and the students asked, well, is the Board of Trustees going to do that as well? Are they going to be a unit and set some goals? And so the board said, sure. Yeah, of course, of course we will, right? And so I loved seeing how um, the board responded to the student voices, and they set goals, and they uh, were able to achieve those goals. So that was that was fantastic. I think that we have had the opportunity to um, to make some. Uh, develop some new processes for hiring and for active recruiting as well. And uh, those have been beneficial. We've had some phenomenal new uh, faculty who have joined us here at Hope. Um, and, and I think that that's been really good. The, um, the processes that we engage incorporate um, some training that also ha talks about implicit bias and how it might potentially impact our processes. And so I think that that's another place that we've grown. Um, and so folks who are participating on a search committee process um, must complete that training prior to getting access to reviewing the candidate materials. And I think that that's been, that's been really good. So those are some of the things. Um, I think the growth in our multicultural student organizations and the activity that you all have demonstrated has been fantastic. I love also the community when MSOs are working together and collaborating. That has just been, uh, I think, really phenomenal. I think some of the areas where we uh, can continue to grow, I think, is retention, right? So I think that recruitment efforts, so I didn't say, like admissions over the years also has incorporated some um, new approaches. There is a multicultural admissions team, right? And so I think that there have been, there have been foci on the recruitment side of things. There definitely have been actions on the retention side of things. We have a new retention coordinator position. That position has morphed some in order to meet needs. And so I think that those things are great. I think we just have more opportunity to continue to grow and thinking about how we can um, effectively meet needs in, in ways that will that we'll retain and folks that want, will want to stay here with us at Hope. Thank you. So in order to respect you all's time, we're not going to take any more questions, but I want to thank you guys again for coming out. Um, and once again, Dr. Trim Brown, thank you for speaking, educating, and bringing awareness with your lecture today. It would be a dream if we could all become an agent of change for equity and inclusion to become advocates within our community. Now, to end our scheduled program with some shameless self-promotion for BSU. I want to be a good secretary if I didn't do that. Um, we have two events coming up next week. We have a financial literacy workshop on February 21st, and we have our annual Black Excellence Dinner on February 24th. Both of these events are only open to Hope's community, and to ensure we are serving all of our guests, we ask that you RSV for our Black Excellence Dinner so your spot is reserved. 
Um, our forum will close tomorrow at noon, so if you want to sign up, be sure to email bsu at hope.edu or find our silent link on our Instagram page. And if you're still interested in learning about African American art, BSU's library display is centered around people who have helped pave the way for black voices in music, entertainment, and so much more. Thank you to all of those who are involved in this event, BSU, the Culture of Inclusive Excellence Division, the Grow Advisory Council, and the Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We would also like to invite you to our next diversity lecture, which is the Women's Histories Month panel on Tuesday, March 5th at 4 p.m. <laughs> and in this room, so. Um, you can see the image above for details, but we also have free t-shirts on the table to the right to celebrate um, the anniversary of CDI's 40th birthday. So thank you all again for your time here tonight and have a great evening. Mm -hmm.